Amen. Jesus Messiah. That is got to be one of my favorite songs. And that's the topic for today. Go figure. Jesus on Easter. Sometimes that bunny rabbit and the Easter eggs hijack Easter, don't they? I don't know how all that got started, but anyway, that's not the topic today. Jesus is the topic, and, and I love when Easter time comes around. A lot of people only go to church on Easter. They only go to church on Christmas. Those are the two, the two days of the year that they go. Well, now you're all at home and you're bored, so you, you have to go to church to do something different. So you just log in, you sign in, you tune in. So I'm glad that each and every one of you are here, that you're joining us for our Easter service today, where we have entitled the, the message today, He is risen. And I love the graphics, and I love all the talk on social media of that the churches may be empty, but the tomb is as well. Amen. But that's not the point. The empty tomb is not the point of Easter. The point of Easter is that Jesus is risen. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Listen, this is a special day, and it's a day that we don't just celebrate, celebrate Jesus. We don't just celebrate the fact that he came. We don't just celebrate the fact that, that he died on the cross for us, that he was buried for us. We celebrate that he rose again. We celebrate his resurrection because that's what makes the difference between Christianity and all those other religions in the world. It's the resurrection that sets Christianity off. It's the resurrection that makes Jesus worth following. Now let's look at our passage today. We're not in John today. We are going to be in there for a little bit. But our passage today is in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28. Turn to that with me, and we're going to start reading here in verse 1. We're going to go down through about verse 15, but we're going to do it in pieces. So we're going to look at verse 1 through 6 to start. Verse 1 says this, Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. In verse 5 it says, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Let's pray for our services this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the message of the resurrection. I thank you for the opportunity to continue to share God's word, even in a time where we're social distancing. Lord, we thank you that even though we can't be together, that you can still be with us, that you can still be in our midst, where, whether we're in our cars or in our bedrooms or in our living rooms or even just here with these few people in the church. Lord, we know that you're there. We know that, that you don't, you, you'll never leave us, that you don't forsake us, even in times of viruses, even in times where we have to take extra measures to protect people. But we thank you for that, and we pray that you would open our eyes as we unpack this passage that we're so familiar with, that we've probably seen many, many times. Lord, show us something new this morning, something that we can use as we make our 411 calls this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now listen, what happened in this passage should not have been a surprise. What happened that very first Easter was no surprise. The events that, that uh, 
took place during the last week of Jesus' life here on earth, they actually took place. And they should not have been a surprise. It was not a surprise that he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. It was not a surprise that he was captured. It was not a surprise that he was convicted in a mock trial, something that would never have flown before. It was not a surprise that he was crucified on a cross, that he paid the penalty for our sins. It was not a surprise that he was buried. And trust me, it should not have been a surprise that that tomb was found empty. You see, we could go back to the Old Testament and we could see this was, this was all foretold. It was, all, it was prophesied that Jesus would come. That he would be crucified and buried and raised again three days later. Listen, three days later, after Jesus was buried in the tomb, there should have been a crowd at the tomb. You see, because a lot of that crowd claimed to be followers of God. They claimed to follow God the Father. So they should have been waiting. They should have been counting the days. They should have said, 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 Scripture says in three days he'll raise again. So we need to be there to see it. Why is it that they weren't there? Why is it that the only people there were the guards? It should not have been a surprise. But it was. It was a surprise to the two Marys. It was a surprise to the disciples. When we read our passage and the rest of it, and we go over to some of the, the parallel passages, we're going to touch one of those over in John. We'll see that even the disciples were surprised that Jesus rose from the grave. The guards were surprised. Even the authorities that crucified Jesus were surprised. They all acted surprised. But it happened exactly the way he said it would happen. It should not have been a surprise. Listen, the two Marys were so surprised to find that the tomb was empty, empty that they acted in fear and disbelief when you read the rest of our passage. The disciples were so surprised, they got into a race. A couple of them got into a race to go and see. They're like, you got to be kidding me. It's empty, just like he said it would be. They got into a race over it. They had to run and see it for themselves. The guards that were there, the only ones present three days later, that when it all happened, the guards were so surprised, they passed out. And the authorities were so surprised that they needed a cover-up. See, they didn't expect the resurrection. They posted guards because they expected someone to steal the body of Christ. And that's why I say the emphasis today is not on the empty tomb. The emphasis is on the fact that Jesus is risen. That's why the tomb is empty. But why would they need a cover up? Why would they need to cover it up? Because the empty tomb caused a problem for them. See, it either meant that the body had been stolen or that Jesus was telling the truth. And either way, that spelled trouble for the authorities. You understand that, right? You see, the authorities are the few. The crowd was the many. The authorities were the few, and, and they were afraid of what the crowd would do on two counts. One, if Jesus was telling the truth, they were in trouble because they just crucified the Messiah. They just crucified the Lord and Savior that was predicted would come into the world. And they were not just in trouble with him. They were in trouble with the crowd. And they were, uh, they were afraid of how the crowd would react. That they would crucify them. So they were afraid for their lives. On the second account, if the body had been stolen, again, they were in trouble. They posted guards. They were responsible for that body to make sure it did not get stolen and they were going to have to prove it because if they couldn't prove it everything that they knew all the knowledge that they thought they had all of that would come crashing down 
and the crowd would have a problem with them. So they were afraid of the crowd. So the authorities decided, well, let's go with the cover-up. Let's go with the cover-up story that someone broke in and stole the body. That's what they went with. Even though they couldn't prove it, a lot of people still believe this today. In fact, I saw this morning on Facebook, there was a, a sunrise service in Israel. And it was, it was titled something like Jews for Jesus. Listen, not all Jews are non-believers. Some of them have seen the truth. And some of them this morning are celebrating their risen Savior, Jesus Christ. But not all of them. Some of them still believe today. And some people in our very midst, in our very nation, they still believe that the body of Christ was stolen that there's no way that he could have risen from the dead. So they believe this lie, and they got caught up in it quickly. But where did the lie come from? Where did it start? Well, if we look down a little further in our passage, skip down with me to verse 11, and we'll see where the lie came from. Verse 11 says this, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave a sufficient, listen to this now, a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, lie to everyone. They said, tell people, they said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they lied to everyone. They took the money and did as they were directed. And this story, this lie, has been spread among the Jews to this very day. To this day. There it is. Scripture says that's a lie. Listen, people that believe that the body of Christ was stolen, they ought to read the Bible. They ought to read the Bible because the Bible itself says that was a made-up story. It was a cover-up story. It was a way for the authorities to not get in trouble with the crowd. It was a way for them to maintain the kingdom that they had built and not sacrifice it for the kingdom of the Savior, the Messiah, that they had just crucified. They ought to read the Bible. It's not true. It's a lie. But even Mary believed it for a short time. Look at this over in a parallel passage. It'll be on the screen for you in John chapter 20 and verse 2. Talking about this very same story that we're covering here in Matthew. Verse 2 says this. So she, that's Mary, ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that's John, and the, the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, they, <clears throat> whoever that they is, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. You see, even Mary thought that the body had been stolen for just a little while. And she goes on and she says, they've taken him away and, and we don't know where, where they've laid him. She thought the body had been stolen. Later, she says, she says something like, if you've carried him away to the gardener, she says, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and we'll take care of the body. <clears throat> Here's what she didn't know. She didn't know who that gardener was. She didn't know the identity of the gardener that she was speaking to. Watch this in a parallel passage, John chapter 20, just a little bit further down in verse 14. It says this, having said this, she, Mary, turned around and saw Jesus standing. She didn't know it was Jesus, but she saw him, and she, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Look at verse 15. 
And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And watch this in verse 16. This is a special time between Mary and not her son, but her Savior. Jesus said to her, Mary. And that's all it took. That one word, her name. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Listen, when Jesus called Mary by name, it made all the difference in the world. All of a sudden, the lie was dispelled. The lie was put down. The cover up, it, it was over. And Mary understood at that moment that that was her savior and that what he had said would come true, what scripture in the Old Testament predicted would come true had just taken place. That first Easter morning. Yes, the tomb was empty. But the point is that Jesus had risen. Listen, Jesus calls you by name too. Listen, if you don't know Jesus today, he's standing there. And you might be today just like Mary. And you might not understand who he is. But that's who we're talking about today. This Jesus. All he has to say is your name. All you have to do is turn to him and ask for forgiveness. And he says, I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you. Can you imagine the picture in heaven right now? Can you imagine what's going on in heaven? When Jesus was crucified and he was laid in the tomb. And now time seems to stand still. I love the song that I'm trying to think of, uh, I know Hillsong has a song that has it in there. And it talks about a time where all of heaven held its breath. You understand angels are not omniscient. They don't know everything. They were created for a specific purpose. To worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I can only imagine. That they did. They held their breath for three days. Is it really going to happen? Is he really coming back? Or is he really gone? But then Jesus calls Mary's name. And everybody all of a sudden knows. But how in the world could it be that he's standing there? Because you see the Marys, they were there. They saw him crucified. They understood that he was gone. They were eyewitnesses. They knew that he was dead when they put him in the tomb. They understood that. And yet, here he is. The truth is, he'd risen just like he said. That grave was empty that first Easter morning, just like he said it was. Christ had become victorious over the grave. He defeated sin. He defeated Satan. He defeated death all in one fell swoop. That's what happened that first Easter. Easter when the tomb became empty because he was risen just like he said listen nobody stole the body from the tomb the evidence of the tomb itself speaks differently one put the, think about this why were the grave clothes still there when we read the passages that talk about this very event we see that the grave clothes were left in the grave but the cover-up story was that the body was stolen. How in the world would the grave clothes still be there if the body was stolen? Listen, if somebody comes in to your house and they break in, they're not going to sit down and watch Netflix. You understand that, right? They're not going to sit down and, and cook a meal. They're not going to smoke a brisket. You understand that takes time. They're in a hurry. They're trying to get away with something. They want to get in and they want to get out. If they stole the body, why would they unwrap it? That makes no sense. How in the world would they get past the guards? They were guarded, 
guarding the tomb with, under threat of losing their lives if the body was stolen. Secondly, not only were the grave clothes there, but one of them was folded. You see, that shows purposeful action. If I'm, in, if I'm breaking into somebody's house and I trash everything, I'm not going to take time to make their bed. I'm not going to take time to fold their laundry. You understand? If I'm going to steal the body of Jesus, I'm going to snatch that thing out of the tomb and I'm going to run them. Great clothes and all. We'll deal with that stuff later. You understand that, right? So the, the cover-up story doesn't hold water. If there was a jury there for this cover-up story and they were listening to this, they, they would throw this out. They would say, that doesn't make any sense. You, you, that, that, no, that's a lie. It can't have happened that way. They would have taken the grave clothes. They would have not folded one of them and laid it there. Listen, that shows purposeful action. That was Jesus. He purposefully folded that because he wanted us to know today, and he wanted those people, that crowd, the crowd that crucified him, the crowd that was on the fence about whether or not he was the Savior or not. He says, I want everyone to understand that I did this, that I got up, that I, I walked out on my own. There's no way in the world that any court would ever convict anybody of saying or or." or or by the story, in other words, that the body was stolen. Those grave clothes were taken off by the one who wore them that day. And listen, when he took them off, he wasn't in a hurry. He wasn't like somebody who breaks into your house. He wasn't in a hurry. He took the time to take them off. He could, took the time to fold them. He didn't have to do that. You understand, he's God. He can do anything. He can get up. He can walk out. He didn't even have to roll the stone away. Listen, the stone was rolled away for you. And it was rolled away for me. It wasn't rolled away so that he could get out. It was rolled away so, so that we could see that it was empty. That's why it was rolled away. Otherwise, he could have left it sealed. He could have left the grave clothes laying right where they were. He didn't have to take them off. He didn't have to fold some of them. He could have just got up and walked out on his own. But he didn't. He left evidence. He left proof that he is the Messiah. Isn't that exactly what we've been covering in the book of John? For the past five and a half months, we've been talking about John. And we're talking about how Jesus didn't call us to a blind faith. He called us to a faith based on evidence, based on proof that he is the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you and I alike can have eternal life. Jesus took those great clothes off on purpose. He folded on purpose. He left them on purpose, and he had the stone rolled away on purpose as evidence for you and I. Listen, some of us are still on the fence. Some of us, we've only tuned in today because it's Easter. We're, we're not believers. We, listen, what's it going to take for you to understand that Jesus actually came? That he actually died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins? The Bible says that everyone is a sinner. And that there's a penalty for sin, and that's death. Eternal separation from God. What's it going to take for you to believe that all of this actually happened? Because the evidence is against you. The evidence is for the Savior. The proof would stand in court. The tomb is empty. That alone should be evidence enough. What's it going to take for you to believe? What's it going to take for us believers to actually act like he rose? Because we don't live that way. The tomb being empty is only part of the story. And I love the fact that people are posting that on social media and, and talking about it, but I wish they would follow it up with a because. If you say the tomb is empty, 
then tell them why. Because half of the world right now understands that the tomb was empty, and they still believe that the body was stolen. So take a stand and say, not only is the tomb empty, I know the reason that the tomb is empty, and it's because Jesus has risen. That's why it's empty. Here's my question. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about the fact that Jesus has risen? There were over 500 eyewitnesses that saw Jesus after the resurrection. Now, if this were a court of law, we could parade every single one of those in here, and they would give testimony that, yep, I saw him, I saw him, I saw him. I think that's overwhelming evidence. And I don't understand how people can still believe a lie that Scripture even points out is a lie. I don't understand that. That, that goes beyond my human capability to, to, to reason with that kind of evidence. Jesus is the Christ. That's obvious from our passage it's obvious from scripture. It's obvious that he became sin for you and for me. It's obvious that he paid the penalty, that he was buried. And it's obvious that he rose again. Mm -hmm. Buddha started his own religion called Buddhism. He died in 483 B.C. His body is still in the grave. Confucius started a, a confusing religion called Confucianism. He died in 479 BC and his body is still in the grave. Muhammad, you're familiar with him, he started the religion of Islam. He died in June of 632 and his body is still in the grave today. Joseph Smith started Mormonism. He died in 1844 and his body is still in the grave. Mary Baker Eddy started the Christian Science Movement. She died in 1910, and she's still in the grave today. At least her body is. Ron Hubbard started the Church of Scientology. He died in 1986. And if you're following the pattern here, you can probably guess what I'm going to say next. His body is still in the grave. All of those people who started their own religion their graves are all still occupied. You understand that, right? That's what sets Christianity apart. That's what sets what you believe apart from all these others. All of those others, their graves are full. They're still occupied. Why do you think Scripture points out that Jesus was laid in a borrowed tomb? You see, that fellow was going to need that tomb one day. And Jesus says, I just need it for three days. That's why it was a borrowed tomb. All scripture is there for a reason. Even the words like borrowed tomb make a difference in the message. He didn't need it for very long. That's why we celebrate Easter the way we do, because it's not full. The tomb that he was laid in might have someone in it, but it's not him. And that person was put in it later. You understand? It was a borrowed tomb. He's risen. Friends, Jesus died almost 2,000 years ago. And his grave is empty because he is risen. When we talk about Easter today and the couple of days in the future, make sure you make that a point. That the tomb is not just empty, it's empty for a reason. It's empty because he has risen. Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father. And he now awaits the sound of the trumpet where he can call all of his children home. And trust me, if you're not a believer today, he sits waiting for you. I talked about earlier that I thought I could only imagine that maybe the angels in heaven just held their breath 
waiting to see if it would happen. I can only imagine Jesus standing there today watching you, watching me online from wherever you're at, and he's holding his breath, and he's waiting, and he's telling you, he says, look, I did this for you. It's all for you. I just want you to turn to me and repent. Ask me to forgive your sins. And all Jesus had to say is your name. Like he did with Mary, he just said, Mary. And that fast, Mary believed. She believed why the tomb was empty all of a sudden. What's it going to take? Listen, I'm going to ask Brother Phil to come and we're going to enter into a time of invitation here. Listen, if, if you're an unbeliever, don't click that big X before you know for sure who Jesus is. Who that is that that we're talking about, that we're celebrating every Easter, that, that the tomb is empty because he is risen. Don't, don't log out of Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're watching us right now. Don't log out. You stay with us. And you listen. Listen, Jesus is there and he's waiting on you. You're not tuned in today by accident. You're tuned in today on purpose. You have a divine appointment with your Lord and Savior. Now, how about you believers? For you believers out there, the grave is empty because Jesus has risen. Why is it that you don't live like it? Why is it that you live as if he is still dead? As if the grave defeated him. As if we're defeated. Listen, some of us with our posts on social media, and listen, I'm proud of our church, and I want to say that right now. You have posted so much positive stuff this week on social media. I am so proud that you were the hands and feet of Jesus this week to a lost and dying and confused world. I'm glad you did that. I'm proud of you for doing that. But I'm asking you to stop living like he's still dead. 